Thanks, Brandis. Lincoln Park Zoo has named its next president and CEO. Current zoo director Dr. Megan Ross has been selected to lead the venerable institution when current president and CEO Kevin Bell steps down at the end of the year. Ross is an animal behavior specialist and she joined the zoo as curator of birds in 2000 and will be the first woman to lead the zoo in its 153 year history. And joining us now to talk about the challenges of the pandemic and her vision for the zoo is Dr. Megan Ross, president and CEO elect at Lincoln Park Zoo. Dr. Ross, congratulations to you and welcome to Chicago tonight. Thank you so much. So Happy we mentioned here. it's glad it's great to have you. We mentioned that distinction. First woman to lead the zoo in 153 years. Also the first practicing scientist. What do those distinctions mean to you? Well, you know, when I was a little girl, when I thought about what I wanted to do with my life, the idea that I could work with animals didn't really cross my mind because I thought you could be a veterinarian or you didn't work with animals. And so for me, I love the idea that I can showcase that I'm a scientist. I study animals. I study animals by watching them and figuring out what's going on in their mind and trying to provide the best care that I can for them. And I think it's exciting to be able to highlight different types of scientific career options. And you've been running the day-to-day -day operations of the zoo for a long time, especially this last uh, year and a half has been difficult because of the pandemic. What have some of the biggest challenges been? Well, you know, we're for wildlife for all and we're free and open 365 days a year. So I think our biggest challenge was that we closed back in March uh, 2020 for an extended period of time. Since 1868, we've only been closed for five days before that. So that was one of our biggest challenges. And then when we reopened, trying to figure out how to do reservations was totally new to us. So those are some of our biggest challenges, but I'm so happy that we're back and the gates are open and we're now no reservations needed and continuing to be free and available to all of Chicago. And I wonder if the animals are happy or sad to see all the visitors again. You know, we've seen some COVID outbreaks uh, at other zoos. Uh, at the Zoo Atlanta, 18 of 20 gorillas reportedly tested positive for COVID. So how do you prevent a COVID outbreak at Lincoln Park Zoo and what's the situation there? So we're preventing COVID outbreaks just like you're protecting other people that you know. We're wearing masks, we're using our PPE, we're washing our hands, we're doing a lot of the same things. We've been using personal protective equipment for all of our animal care staff that have worked with non-human primates for a good two decades now. So for us, there wasn't too much of a shift when we've been working with our non-human primates, so monkeys and apes. Um, and now we have the rest of our staff using personal protective equipment to protect the animals. And we've been so pleased that we haven't had a single case of COVID here at Lincoln Park Zoo in our animals. All right, knock on wood. Now, are you giving COVID vaccines to animals? And what are the most vulnerable animals? We are going to be giving COVID vaccines to our animals uh, in the next couple of weeks. And the most vulnerable animals from what we have seen in other institutions tend to be non-human primates, uh, cats, and mustelids, so if you think about like ferrets and uh, otters, that type of animal. Yeah. I would say the smelly animals is what I think of when I think of mustelids. Oh, the smelly <laughs> animals go first. All right, well, you know, zoos have these dual functions. Obviously, uh, visitors come and see animals, but also they lead the way in conservation efforts around the world. So what's your vision in terms of uh, Lincoln Park Zoo helping out with animal conservation? So Lincoln Park Zoo is really rooted in science and how we do everything here at the zoo and all of our conservation work. We're very focused on providing the best care, providing um, amazing conservation impact, and also working with the community. Uh, our conservation efforts have really focused in on some key areas. So we work in the Republic of Congo, where we are studying chimpanzees and gorillas in a relatively untouched part of the world and making sure that we understand the impacts of logging on them so that we can help mitigate those issues. We're working in Tanzania to understand how mammals are migrating across that landscape and how we can work with communities who need lands protected for their, for their historic rights in Tanzania mm -hmm. and also making sure that the animals that use those paths are gonna be able to have those spaces protected for them. And we're also working in Southeast Asia, looking at mitigating some of the effects of wildlife trafficking. We additionally have been really focused on understanding what's going on with the world as it urbanizes and more humans are in conflict or could be in conflict with wildlife. And how can we make sure that we can design the cities of the future? So we have a whole 
field called the Urban Wildlife Information Network that is partnering with different cities across North America right now, where um, we are studying urban wildlife and trying to figure out how we can design the cities of the future where both humans and wildlife can thrive. Yeah, I've been to some of those national parks in Tanzania and the animals are just spectacular there. You know, zoos are beloved places, but over the years they've had their critics, you know, saying that uh, animals don't belong out in the wild and, and zoo spaces are too limiting for them. What do, how do you address those critics? I think that a lot of people who have those types of criticisms of zoos don't necessarily understand what zoos are today. So zoos are one of the biggest uh, contributors to conservation in the world. And uh, also zoos are really uh, studying animals that are in our care so that we can help conserve them in the wild. So a good example of that is that we do a lot of studies here where we're trying to understand the minds of some of our animals. Some of them even interface with touchscreen computers. And we can ask them questions that really help us understand their perception of the world around them. And by understanding that, we can take that information and put it into conservation impact in the wild. A lot of important work. All right. Well, once again, Dr. Megan Ross, congratulations and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.